January 8th, 1998. A seemingly uninteresting day in the latter half of the 90s that, in fact, kicked off an important spree of shows in one particular genre of anime. 1998 was the year that gave us Serial Experiments Lane, Bubblegum Crisis 2040, Princess 9, and Lost Universe. But 1998 was also the year that Space Western became a term we would all come to know. What with the airing of the undisputed anime classic Cowboy Bebop and the almost equally popular 90s series Trigon. But January 8th specifically is important because it was the start of the first big space western series in a year that gave us the best of them. January 8th was the day that Outlaw Star first aired. Ladies, gentlemen, and others, my name is Arcada, and welcome to Glass Reflection, where today we are taking a look at long last upon the 1998 sci-fi western series based on the manga by Takahito Aito and produced by the 90s juggernaut studio Sunrise. Today, we are talking about Outlaw Star. Let's jam. <laughs> Outlaw Star is a 26 episode anime based on the original sci fi manga by Takahito Aito, and it follows the adventures of the soon to be crew of a spaceship called the Outlaw Star. Leading our team of big goddamn heroes is Gene Roddenberry Min, Starwind. With his partner and crime, the brains of the operation, 11-year-old Jim Hawking. The pair start off as bounty hunters for hire on the backwater planet of Sentinel-3, doing odd jobs and taking bounties where they can. They're not half bad at it either, earning more in bounty rewards in their first five minutes on screen than the crew of the Bebop did in its entire run. Okay, Clyde, you can call the sheriff now. Jean! I'm so scared! Oh, Iris, it's okay now. Huh, is that why you have your hand on her ass? <laughs> so, you think everything's okay, Jean? And what about the damage to my bar? Hmm. Jim, what's the bounty on this death rob guy? 4,000 Wong. Pay the repairs and deposit what's left. Tonight, I'm gonna hit the town! But eventually, they bite off more than they can chew, agreeing to unknowingly protect notorious outlaw Hot Ice Hilda and a hidden suitcase from an even worse band of pirates who looked like they came straight out of Little China. Turns out the suitcase, in a scene that Joss Whedon must have loved oh so much before he wrote, Firefly contains a young android girl named Melfina. Melfina was designed to be the navigation component to the greatest spaceship ever designed. I wonder what that ship's called. We might never know. The newly joined group of misfits then promptly find the location of this ship called the Outlaw Star and blast it out of its hiding place while battling the aforementioned pirates. And then we reach a point narratively where we have some semblance of a status quo. Thus, the story of Outlaw Star can truly begin because this ends the very loose description of the show's first four episodes. From this point on, the story of the series bounces back and forth between plots that continue the arcing narrative about the origins of the outlaw star, the ship, and more one-off stories that both help to flesh out the show's very expansive universe and also explain the in-universe logistics of how the hell you pay for food and fuel in this particular sci-fi sandbox. Eventually, we gain new crew members in the form of samurai assassin Twilight Suzuka, a woman who seems to enjoy the art of killing, but not so much to make her a psychopath, along with the anthropomorphic tiger woman Aisha Clan Clan of the Katal Katal Empire. And yes, that took like five takes to say properly, Aisha, your name is insane. Both of these crew members ended up joining the Outlaw Star after failing to kill Jean in combat, and because they too are somewhat interested in the show's arcing plot about the legendary Galactic Ley Line. Information about the Ley Line itself is few and far between. All that's hinted about it for the majority of the show is that this Ley Line is the final resting place of the galaxy's biggest and greatest treasure. Beyond that, though, 
little is known about it. But Outlaw Star is a series that likes to focus less on the destination, being this great grand treasure, and more on the journey. The goal of reaching the ley line is brought up enough just so that you don't forget about it, but it's never hammered to death, and it's treated more of a an eventuality that the characters will reach it at some point. And I like this way of storytelling a lot when it's done well, and here Outlaw Star is a perfect example of it, so much so that the series really should be listed in the dictionary under the word pacing. Not much in this show happens too fast or gets dragged out in such a way that it feels unnatural or forced for the sake of the narrative. Everything is wrapped up in this air of sci-fi pulp that brings you back to the age of Space Adventure Cobra. Or rather, a time when I watched Space Adventure Cobra. I wasn't actually alive when it aired. Hmm. But there's so much to this universe that's only touched on, shown in glimpses, but never expanded upon. And this is done in a good way, because it shows off this weird futuristic atmosphere that allows the viewers to fill in the blanks to better their own experience, and it just gives us enough to get there. There are characters with cyber prosthetics, characters whose relationships are developed purely because one hacks into another's brain on multiple occasions. But while these elements exist, I wouldn't say that the series is trying to be hard sci-fi in the traditional sense. More like it really wishes that it was hard sci-fi, and there are times that it tries to act like it, but if you know the definition of hard sci-fi, this is not that. Sometimes, though, it almost feels like Outlaw Star just doesn't know what it wants to be thematically. Like, if it wanted to be a serious space show, it's got that atmosphere down pat when it wants to use it. But occasionally, it, it loses the ball because there's just so much randomness added to the setting. Everything and the kitchen sink can be found in this show without too much difficulty. There are entire episodes that are more or less diversions from the main story that don't provide any real development for the cast. And while this could be an interesting way to tell stories about the setting in lieu of proper development, more often than not, the plot of these episodes falls heavily into generic sci-fi storytelling. Well, that and the One Hot Springs episode. So really, there's generic anime storytelling in there as well, especially considering that if we ignore Jim from the cast due to his young age, Gene Starwind is surrounded by his own unique space fantasy harem in true anime style. Ah, <sighs> damn it. Which leads to the biggest problem I have with Outlaw Star. Gene Starwind. His introduction and initial story sets him up to be one sly, Han Solo-esque badass, and at several points this is compounded at certain times when he defeats Suzuka and the like. But for every badass moment that Gene has, there's also a moment where he's the exact opposite of the cool exterior he exudes. He starts off with an almost irrational fear of spaceflight that's heavily focused on before being abandoned because, hey, 80% of the plot takes place in space, so it makes no sense that he would continue to be terrified by it. He constantly complains that they have no money, despite not actually doing anything active besides sitting on his ass waiting for the perfect job to come along, leaving Jim to shoulder most of the work and actually keeping the outlaw star fueled. And finally, when shit hits the fan, Gene is the first one to barge into the fray headfirst, without any plan or strategy, the knowledge that everything will just work out. Lucky for him, being the protagonist and all, it always does work out, because it has to. I've not often seen a show that seems to somewhat be aware of the narrative limitations of its own story while never directly acknowledging it in a meta-like way. The problem with all of this is that it doesn't make him a likable protagonist. We don't have an emotional connection with him because his idiocy makes him hard to relate to. The show tries to have heartfelt moments involving Gene, despite our lack of that emotional connection, but it just usually falls flat. What's worse is that Gene's story is what takes precedence over the rest of the crew. While they do have their own minor storylines, this is still Gene's show, so there are limitations on how much development they can reasonably expect. It's kind of weird for me, actually, because I have fond memories of this one autumn season back in grade school that I spent living in Florida with Toonami as my primary means of entertainment, and back then, I thought that Gene's story was really dark and personal and full of secrets. 
Sure enough, if you actually go back and watch a number of those Toonami promos, you can still get that feeling out of them. It's a shame, though, that it doesn't 100% translate to the show itself. Believe in yourself and create your own destiny. Don't fear failure. I think that might come down to the animation style as well. This is pre-digital times, and if you wanted some hand-drawn animation based in space, Sunrise was the studio to do it. Everything about the setting, from the planetary backgrounds, the vastness of space, and the ships that occupy it are all beautifully rendered in a way that sets off my nostalgia meter real hard. It's like looking at vintage hardware from pre-internet times. I just like looking at cell animation when it is this clean. Shame the character designs don't have the same amount of polish, as in many cases the character features can change from scene to scene, being very inconsistent. It's not so glaring that it's distracting, but it was glaring enough for me to notice, so I felt I should mention it. As far as the voice cast goes, this is one of those weird shows where I wish I could have a, a combination between the English and the Japanese voices for a variety of reasons. On the English side, we have major nostalgic nods for me, with the voices of Brianne Siddall as Jim Hawking, Wendy Lee as Suzuka, and the absolutely fantastic Mary McGlynn as Hot Ice Hilda. But on the Japanese side, you have the debut performance of Ayako Kawasumi, who played Melfina. Kawasumi would later gain massive prominence as the voice of Saber for every fate iteration that actually gives that character a voice. But unfortunately, we can't have a weird combination of both voice tracks into one, so I usually just stick to the English for the nostalgic purposes of it. What Outlaw Star is able to do is somehow work through a lot of its flaws for the betterment of the series as a whole. The show is filled with interesting concepts from ships with combat-oriented grappler arms to the use of magic in a science fiction setting, something few sci-fi shows touch on, let alone do this well. In trying to come up with a rating for this series, I had a lot of difficulty because a lot of Outlaw Star is very nostalgic for me. I enjoyed watching it back then, and I enjoyed watching it way back then, and while I did enjoy watching it now in more modern times, further along in my life and experience as an anime fan, I can more easily find the problems now that I just can't ignore. Before popping the discs into my Blu-ray player to rewatch the series, I did have to think in the back of my mind, why is it that Outlaw Star isn't remembered as fondly as those other shows from 1998? Why do people still talk highly about Bebop and Trigon more so than Outlaw Star? I think the reason is because, while we can still be major fans of the show for its interesting concepts, because it doesn't know what it wants to do much of the time, it doesn't end up doing anything specific particularly well. It's not really a show about bounty hunters because, yeah, while they do take bounty-like jobs, that's not their particular thing. Outlaw Star is more like the Red Mage, a jack-of-all-trades, master-of-none series for the space western genre. There are a lot of things that it does, but nothing that it tries to do, it does better than any other show. It is the combination of all these things, though, that make it unique and interesting, even if it doesn't make it fantastic. Of course, nothing stops it from being an absolutely enjoyable show to watch, however, which is why I'm going to give it the Glass Reflection rating to buy it. While I do understand that it has flaws, which is why I wouldn't go so far as to say that it is the best of the best, it's just really good for what it is, and I think you should watch it when you get the chance. Which you can do if you happen to have access to the legal streaming sites that it is currently hosted on, currently being Funimation for the dub and Crunchyroll for the sub. So thank you for watching to the end of this video. Follow me on Twitter if you feel so inclined, and a very special thank you to all of my patrons who not only support my work in general, but allow me to do videos where I can talk about the shows that I am passionate about instead of sticking to the bigger blockbusters for every single video. Though those are coming. Those are coming. I do appreciate and love you all. Specifically though, as I like to do, I want to give a particular shout out to patrons Rune Jacobson, Joshua Garcia, Calhoun Boy, Sidi Yamiko, Victor Eckmark and Rifen Bonaparte for being especially awesome. You guys are great. And until next time, ladies, gentlemen, and others, watch more anime. Stay frosty. <laughs>